Welcome back to The Mindful Hunter. I'm your host as always, Jay Nickel. And today we are doing a comprehensive analysis and review of 10 by 42 binoculars, six pairs specifically, like a Trinovid, Zeiss Conquest, uh, Tract Toric, Athlon Cronus G2, Swarovski NL Pure, and Leica Noctivid. Now, before we dive into the review, we got a little bit of housekeeping. So this review, along with all my other reviews, are brought to you by Mindful Reviews. Now, Mindful Reviews is the online platform that I built. It's a community where like-minded members get together to discuss gear, uh, participate in raffles, monthly draws, all kinds of great stuff. So there's currently 194 members. I am going to be raffling off the pair of binoculars that had the highest score out of all six of these. To participate in that raffle, you have to belong to Mindful Reviews. So you go to mindful-reviews.com. Now, if you are interested in participating in that raffle, I recommend you pause this video right now because these raffles sell out incredibly quickly. Um, that's the kind of shameless self-promotion out of the way. Now, if you don't know, if you've never watched one of my category-wide reviews, they tend to be really long. I'm gonna do what I can to condense the information. I analyzed 21 different categories across, let me take a look here, one, two, three, four, five different classes, descriptive, construction, optics, performance, and operational. Um, and within those classes, there were a number of categories each. If I spend an in-depth amount of time on each of those categories, this thing's gonna be like three hours long. So I'm gonna do what I can to pick out the highlights and discuss the things that I think mattered. However, I may gloss over some stuff, I may miss some stuff, it's a ton of information to try and look at six pairs of binoculars simultaneously and, and quantify the difference between them. So if you've got something to add, if you think I've missed something, I'm always open to feedback. Please drop it below in the comments on YouTube. If it's something you find valuable, it's quite likely it's something that other people will find valuable as well. And if we can all learn together, we're all the better off for it. Now, the next note I wanna make is why these six binoculars because every time I do one of these I get slammed with messages well why didn't you include this and why didn't you include that so first of all let's start off with the practical limitations I have to source all these binoculars independently it's not like there's like sport optics or your optics has this deal with me where I just send them an email and they send me whatever binoculars I want now, the bigger the channel gets and the bigger the platform gets, the easier it is to put my hands on stuff to review, but it is still quite challenging. And I wanna give you an example. So I included a Maven spotter in my last gear review. And Maven, technically the PR agency that represents Maven who handles their kind of online influencers and affiliate codes, a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago now, sent me an email and said, and at that time I wanted to have a pair of Maven binoculars in here and I was doing my best to get a pair of Maven binoculars. And I was even willing to just pay for their demo rate. Basically with Maven, you can buy a pair of demo binoculars, they'll ship them to you, you can use them for two weeks. If you don't like them, you just ship them back, they refund your credit card, there's no cost to you whatsoever. I was even gonna be willing to do that because I thought it was worthwhile to include them in here. So their kind of PR company gets back to me um, or sends me an unsolicited message and says, hey, we saw the spotter review. We really like what you're doing. We wanna know if you are interested in becoming an affiliate, kind of like a sponsorship. So basically they said, we'll give you a personalized code. You can use that on your website and on Instagram. If people use your code, you're gonna get a kickback. So I got back to them and I explained the situation. I said, I'm not sponsored. I don't have any affiliate deals. I don't want any affiliate deals. I built this platform. It's all about unbiased, non-sponsored reviews. I said, however, I really like your gear. You guys do make for your price point good stuff, like it's a good option. Um, I'm just about to do a binocular review. If you guys wanna send stuff over to review, I don't want any payment. I don't want any affiliate code. You just send it over, I'll review it, and I'll send it back. No response. 
So here's the thing you got to realize. Companies are only interested, for the most part, in sending you their gear if they can link you with some type of financial incentive which would guarantee them a positive review. So as soon as Maven realized that I couldn't be bought and that I was going to give an unbiased review no matter what, they had no interest in talking to me any further. And this is the exact kind of bullshit why I started Mindful Reviews. 90% of the stuff that you see on YouTube is bought and paid for by the brands themselves. And basically the in, these influencers do reviews that are really nothing more than a paid for commercial. So I just wanted to share that. Until further notice, Maven's not welcome on my channel. Just like Vortex is not welcome on my channel anymore either. I don't believe in their marketing practices. I believe only being willing to send a guy who clearly does detailed, unbiased reviews and shows things in the fairest possible light, only being willing to send him, me, gear, if he is willing to engage in some type of financial incentive with you, shows me the nature of the principles at that company. And that's not a company that I want to support and I don't want to help sell their gear even if they would wind up getting positive reviews. So maybe somebody from Maven will reach out, maybe they'll have a change of heart, maybe they, their PR company overstepped their bounds, but it's not the type of relationships I'm interested in those. And let me give you another example. You're gonna see a pair of Tract here, binoculars. I met John, one of the co-founders of Tract at the Abbotsford Sportsman Show. Told him about the channel, told him about the spotting scope review I just did, sent him a link to it, you know, he, we've had a couple emails back and forth. He's like, I really like you're doing what you're doing. If you ever need anything for review, just let us know. I was doing this review. I emailed John. I said, I'd like to include Tract in the review. He said, no problem. We can loan you a pair of binos and sent them right over. Now that to me is the action of a man who believes in his gear. He doesn't feel the need to you know, chain me down with some type of financial incentive to guarantee I'm gonna give a good review. And here's the deal. There's some good stuff with the Tract and there's some not go so good stuff with the Tract, just like there is with all of these binoculars. And it's my job to discuss both. So back to why these six binoculars, from a practical perspective, they were the ones I could get my hands on with the funds and the relationships that I had at my disposal. There's some loaners here, there's some ones I bought, there's some ones set directly from, from companies. I want to give another shout out to SNS Archery that loaned me these Athlon binos. If you want anything from SNS, they're fantastic guys. Uh, link in the description below to their website. Now, the other factor at play here is that I tend to review kind of ultra premium gear. Um, and people get frustrated because I sometimes don't have the best budget options. And it's hard because if you're gonna look at all the premium gear and all the budget gear, it would get overwhelming very fast. So what I did here is I tried to have equal representation from like three categories. So in the premium category, we have the Swarovski NL Pure and the Leica Noctavid. In the mid-range category, we have the Zeiss Conquest and the Leica Trinavid. And then in what I would call the budget category, we have Tract and Athlon. Now, I'm not saying that's an exhaustive representation of each three of these categories, but what I am saying is that we can use what we learned about the relationships between these three categories so that you can infer conclusions about the relationship between binoculars in the budget category to binoculars in the mid-range category. Like what types of differences are there? Are those the type of compromises and sacrifices you're willing to make? What is your actual budget and what should you be expecting to get for that budget? And you can look at you know other um, options like you could look at the SLC instead of the Conquest HD and infer some of the same conclusions that I've come to here. So that's why you have the six binoculars here before you. Am I willing to do this again with a completely different six pairs of binoculars? 100%. So don't feel like I'm asking you not to recommend things you would like to see in the future, but just recognize uh, like I did try to include a representative sample of 
the binoculars that I thought would be most beneficial to people as many people as possible when making a decision. Like if you're interested in premium, there's going to be some thoughts there. If you're interested in budget, there's going to be some thoughts there. So did the best I could, but always open to feedback. So if there's specific binoculars you want to see in the future, let me know. More importantly, go let them know. Like if you want something from a brand or a store, go tell that brand, send them a DM, say Mindful Hunter, Jay, he does these really great reviews. I wanna buy your product, but I'd love to see an unbiased review. Can you send them over a pair? If companies get enough of those type of emails, they'll be more willing to, to send over gear and then I can help share more information with you guys. Okay, one last note. A lot of companies use emotional psychological marketing and you there's this tribalism and you feel like you belong to the brand and the brand belongs you. I am going to make some, you know, mild to bold criticisms about all of these pieces of gear. Some of you probably own these pieces of gear. I don't want you to take that personally and I want you to take it with an open mind. I don't have any grudges against any of these companies and I'm not looking to throw anybody under the bus. I'm trying to be as detailed and quantifiable as possible. And I would ask that you try and be as unbiased as possible when watching this. Just, you know, monitor yourself for like emotional reactions. If you start to get pissed off because I said something, ask yourself, that's really weird. It's just a pair of binoculars. Why did I get so upset at that? Um, and just keep that in mind as you watch the review. I'm trying to be as unbiased as possible when I make this content. And I ask that you try to be as unbiased as possible when you consume this content. And let me quickly tell you something about the scoring system that I've used here on this spreadsheet. So it's called a forced ranking system, which means I'm not scoring each product on each category uh, with a one out of 10. What I'm doing is there are six pairs of binoculars. So the best binocular in a given category gets a one. The worst binocular in a given category gets a six. At the end of the review, the binocular with the lowest score wins. Now, sometimes there's ties, but I do my best to minimize them. And I can tell you there was a very clear outcome, not just about first place, but this, this scoring system, which I've developed over the last year, works extremely well because it forces me to tell you which one is better than the other. And because it uses a relative scoring system, I don't necessarily have to decide what score out of 10 each of this should get. All I have to do is place them in order of quality in any given class and category. And it makes it, it's kind of, in, in some ways a little harder, but in some ways a little bit easier. But in all ways, it ends up giving us a more clear result. All right, let's dig into the first category in class. So this is the descriptive class. And the first category is price. Also, one final note about Mindful Reviews, I will be uploading this spreadsheet to Mindful Reviews after this review. So if you feel like you wanna dig deeper into the data, I also have some interactive components where you can weight the different classes to prioritize things that may mean more to you. And this spreadsheet will be uploaded to Mindful Reviews and everybody's welcome to download it. So if you want it, go join up. So uh, discussing price. So let's start at the top and work our way down. So the NL Pures and all prices are in USD. So keep that in mind. Uh, NL Pures come in at 33.70. The Leica Noctavids are three grand. The Leica Trinavids are a grand. The Conquest HDs are a grand. The Tractor $694 and the Athlons are $500. So you can see also pretty quickly, they group consistently into the categories I was discussing earlier. So the premium are kind of around three grand, the uh, mid-range are around a grand, and the budget uh, moved from 500 to 700. There are cheaper budget binoculars, but really, like let's be honest about this, if you can't find 500 bucks to buy a pair of binoculars, you know, maybe you should go find another sport. Um, I'm not interested in looking at binoculars that are any less than $500 because the, the optical quality just degrades so bad that I can't recommend anybody buy anything. So somebody might say five to $700 doesn't sound very budget. Well, that's as budget as I'm interested in getting. Okay, moving on to weight. Now, one thing that's very interesting is that I typically do a weight honesty calculation. 
And this is where I compare the advertised weight to the uh, actual weight when the product shows up. And I typically notice a discrepancy in the order of like four to seven percent, which is fairly significant. The highest discrepancy here was three percent and it was one ounce. Okay, so I don't think there's there's any reason to get into the weight honesty. I think all these companies did a very good job at sending out a product that weighed what it was advertised at. So what I'm gonna do now is share the weights that I weighed when these showed up from lightest to heaviest. Trinavids, 25.75 ounces. Trax, 27.2 ounces. Conquest, 28.1 ounces. Athlons, 28.1 ounces. Noctavids, 30.3 ounces. And Swaros, 31 ounces. You will notice that the more expensive binoculars tend to be heavier. Better glass weighs more. There's nothing you can do about it. So one of the options that you might want to keep in mind is that you could look at something like a Leica Trinavid, which is a mid-range binocular. You're going to save almost six ounces over a Swaro NL Pure. Now there's a penalty to pay for that, but it's something you may want to keep in mind. Next, we're going to compare the lengths of the binoculars. I thought this was important, A, for packing room, B, for um, what type of binocular harness you can get away with, and C, as we're going to get into later, just the pure ergonomics. Some people might have smaller hands and larger binoculars are difficult to, to handle, and some people like myself kind of have bigger hands and some of the smaller binoculars were actually a little bit difficult to handle. So in order from largest to smallest, the Athlons, 6.3 inches, the Swaros, 6.2 inches, Trax, 6 inches, like a Noctavids, 5.9 inches, Conquests, 5.9 inches, and the Trinavids, the 5.5 inches. So there you will also notice there is a, a shorter, lighter binocular in the Trinavid. Now, there's also some quality of optical viewing experience to be gained by spreading out the distance between your ocular and your objective lenses. So the shorter you make things, the harder it is to produce a high quality image. So keep that in mind as well. Now for the final uh, category within the descriptive class, we have origin. Now I've talked about this before on my uh, spotting scope review and this is somewhat of an ethnocentric like tricky area to get into because I don't want to seem like I don't want to come off as making stereotypes but generally speaking there are places in the world that manufacture better optics than others and there they, there's kind of a hierarchy now it's not a fact you know like just because something is made in Europe isn't a fact that it's better than something made in China but it's not a stretch to say that the, the probability is very high that European glass is going to be better than Chinese glass. And if you were to say something like Japanese glass is probably going to fall somewhere between European glass and Chinese glass, the probability of you being right is extremely high. So I rank ordered them based on the historical data about the origins of manufacture. So. Just to run through them, Athlon is made in China. All Leica products are made in Portugal. Swaro is made in Austria. Tract is made in Japan. And Zeiss is made in Germany. So uh, Zeiss and Swaro uh, came in first place for uh, being made in Europe. Uh, Leica came in second place for being made in Portugal. And because Leica is, especially with their camera lens division, they have a really solid reputation for manufacturing extremely high quality glass and I only thought that was fair. Japan came in third place and China came in fourth, fourth place. Okay, so there's the descriptive class. So let's look at the outcome as a whole. So the Trinavids come in first place with seven points, Zeiss at nine, Tract at 10, Noctavid at 13, Athlon at 14, and Swaro, surprisingly in last place, at 16. Now surprisingly, but not so surprisingly, because the, because the descriptive class was meant to focus primarily on the price and the physical structure. And for example, 
Swaro, being the most expensive and the heaviest piece of glass, does not do well in this class. But that's why I've structured the classes the way I have, because let's say for example, having the, the lightest possible optic while still retaining a good optical performance was what was important to you because you're like an ounce counter or whatever, you would notice that the Trinavid as a mid-range bino with a solid optical performance leaps right off the page as far superior to the NL Pure. So it gives you the ability to take the data and prioritize it the way you want. Up next, we're gonna move on to the construction category and the first class within that category is warranty. So first I'll run through what all the warranties are and then I'll tell you how I scored them. So Athlon has an unconditional lifetime warranty. Both Leica binoculars have a 10 year unconditional warranty followed by a 30 year limited warranty. Swaro has a 10 year limited warranty, Tract has an unconditional lifetime, and Zeiss has five year unconditional limited lifetime. Okay, so how did I score those? Well, if we're just talking about warranties, Athlon and Tract tie for first place for their unconditional lifetime. The two Leica tie for second place with a 10 year unconditional and 30 year limited. And then Swaro comes in at third place with their 10 year limited. Now you might ask why did Swaro with the 10 year limited beat Zeiss with a five year no fault? This is going on word of mouth and experience. Even though Swaro says they have a 10 year limited warranty, I personally haven't found anybody who hasn't been able to get Swaro to fix whatever went wrong with their binoculars in the first 10 years. I've also heard amazing stories about even when you go over that, they apply a very small price premium, like 120 bucks, and they send people new binoculars, like crazy stuff. From everything I've been able to gather through my research, the service and the kind of responsibility that Swaro take for their warranty far exceeds this 10 year limited. And then Zeiss comes in last place at the five year no fault uh, lifetime limited. Now I do want to make a note about unconditional lifetime warranties. You only see these on the lower end brands, okay? Loophold, Maven, Vortex, Athlon, Tract. I've owned the lower end optics. The reason you see this on the lower end optics is that you will need it. It's just a fact. And I almost think it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a purchase choice. You can spend a lot of money on something and likely not need to utilize the warranty, or you can spend less money on something and have a higher probability of needing to use the warranty. But there's that famous scene from Tommy Boy when he's like, I could take a crap in a box and put a lifetime warranty on it and you're just basically gonna have a warrantied piece of crap. I'm not saying the lower end binos are pieces of crap. But if we're gonna be honest about this, ask yourself why those companies felt necessary to put unconditional lifetime warranties on their products in order to achieve sales. Now, some people could reply, it's because, well, no one's ever gonna to need to use them because they're built so well. If that was the case, why wouldn't Swaro, Leica, and Zeist, who are known for building the best optics in the world, use a similar marketing ploy? So again, I'm not drawing conclusions from this, um, I haven't owned Tractor Athlon long enough. I own Vortex and every single Vortex optic that I've ever owned, which is three or four, had to go back into warranty multiple times. Um, so just keep that in mind. Okay, up next is durability. Now I did this through a combination of examining the actual construction of the optic and then kind of crawling the internet, looking for kind of horror stories and customer service stories and like how well did all of these hold up. So coming in at first place was Swaro. Second place are the two Leicas. Tied for third place is the Athlon and the Tract. And then coming in in last place is the Zeiss. Now there's a couple reasons I did this. I don't want to say that Zeiss uh, construction quality is poor across their entire product line, but I've had to send a Zeiss Harpia spotting scope in for warranty twice because of a little plastic component. And 
I think they fixed them on this generation, but the previous generation Zeiss Conquest HDs, if you search Zeiss Conquest HD eye cups, you will literally get a laundry list of people whose eye cups became detached and who had problems with them. And it was like, it's a never ending story. So I kind of had to give Zeiss one on the chin for this because the bottom line is my personal experience combined with the reported experience of the internet says that they have some construction issues, some manufacturing issues that they need to work out because their stuff's not as reliable as it could be. Up next, we're gonna look at weather resistance or how waterproof each of these are. So coming in in first place is the Lycan Noctavid at, uh, it's being waterproof up to a depth of 16.5 feet. The, uh, the NL Pures and the Leica Trinavid tied for second place to a depth of 13.1 feet. The Conquests come in in third place with a uh, depth or a pressure of 400 M bar. And this is basically like an atmospheric rating, like there's one bar of pressure. And so 400 millibar, I believe, is four tenths of a bar. Um, and that relates to about 13 feet as well. Now, both the Athlon and the Tract use the IP measurement system before, which I've talked about before. It's, it stands for ingress protection, and you're gonna have two digits afterwards. The first digit represents the ingress protection from solids. The second digit represents the ingress protection from liquids. And the bigger the number get, the smaller the particle. So an IP of one would be like, my phone can't make it in there. An IP of six would be like fine dust can't make it inside. Uh, neither the Tract nor the Athlon give an ingress protection rating for solids, so it just says X, and their ingress protection rating for liquids is seven, which essentially means it can be submerged for three meters or around nine feet for 30 minutes. One note I do wanna make, um, Athlon was a bit frustrating in their marketing jargon on their site. Like for example, when you look at the weather resistance rating on their site, it just says waterproof. Now I don't know what the actual regulatory requirements, but being water resistant to a depth of three meters for up to 30 minutes is in no way possible in my mind to confuse with waterproof. It's not waterproof. The only thing that's waterproof is like a solid block of glass. You know, as soon as you have moving parts, sliding eye cups, O-rings, different elements, glass parts, pl plastic parts, it's physically impossible for this device to be waterproof. And it just begs the question, like why do you feel the need to exaggerate on your marketing collateral? It erodes my trust in you because you're trying to oversell your product. Athlon as a whole goes way overboard. They basically on their on their marketing collateral say this these are the finest binoculars ever made. And it's like, they're 500 bucks, guys. Like, let's just slow down a little bit and just describe the binoculars for what they are. An excellent value choice, but they are by no means to be confused with a Swarovski product or a Leica or a Zeiss product. Like, it's just slow down. But it's the one thing I want to bring to your attention because when you see... Um, a manufacturer say they're, and this is the other thing, I only ever see lower end brands do this. Vortex says the same thing, waterproof. Um, when, you, when you see companies use terms like this that you know are physically impossible, it means they're trying to cover up something or they're trying to make something look better than it really is. That being said, I contacted Athlon and very quickly they replied to me, this particular pair of binoculars, has a water resistance ranking of IPX7. And I was like, well, that was simple. Why don't you just put that on the website? Like, why did I have to like go out of my way? Like, anyways, they're not waterproof. None of these are waterproof, but that's how they rank for water resistance. Now let's look at frame material. All of these, except for the Zeiss Conquest, are made of magnesium. The Zeiss Conquest are made of aluminum. So basically they all tie for first place and the Zeiss Conquest comes in at second place because in this particular scenario, magnesium is a superior material to be used. 
It's lighter and stronger than aluminum. Only marginally so. It's not a big black mark, but it's definitely a way, you know, Zeiss has shaved some pennies on the manufacturing cost of the Conquest. And one of the reasons why the Conquest are probably coming in heavier than the um, Trinovids, even though in form factor they're incredibly similar. All of these binoculars are gas purged. So if you had like an old Bushnell scope in the 70s, the metal tube ones, and you went from like inside to outside and the inside of the actual scope would fog up and there's nothing you can do about that until the humidity of the internal of the scope matches the humidity of the external to the scope. Um, the way they get around that is they seal these and they purge them with an inert gas. Now different inert gases have different qualities. Four of these binoculars are purged with nitrogen, which is the most common, and two of them, the Athlon and the Tract, are purged with argon. Now, without getting into the details, the funny part about this is argon is a very slightly superior material to use than nitrogen. And I've always been very curious, you know, Vortex is also purged with argon. Um, and it's funny because that's something they don't they don't mind telling you on their website. They'll tell you what inert gas this is purged with because they know it's a selling feature that it's argon, but they won't give you the actual IP rating. They'll just say waterproof. Just like it's pretty apparent why you market the way you market. But anyways, um, I've always been curious why the bigger guys don't use argon. Maybe they're just part of the manufacturing process. If anybody's in the business or has any insight into this, I'd love you to drop a comment down below because I'm I'm interested. But it is a note that the that gas is slightly superior, so Tract and Athlon get a couple extra points here in this category. All right, let's look at construction co totals moving from last place through first place. The Athlon and Tract tie with 10 points a piece. Uh, the Trinovid and the Swaro tie with nine points a piece. And coming in at first place is the Lycanoctivid with eight points. All right. Now let's talk about the actual optics in each one of these binoculars. So the first thing we're gonna look at is prism type. Now I wish I could have found out more information because five of the six of these binoculars all use roof prisms and one pair uses a poro prism. We're gonna get into that in a minute. But in the roof prism category, you have Am Abby Kronig and Schmidt Pishan. And these are different roof prisms and they both have different qualities. And I wouldn't necessarily say like one is ultimately superior than the other because there's weight implications and clarity implications with both. But depending on your use case, knowing which style of roof, roof prism is in each of these would have been beneficial. I couldn't find a reliable source for that information. Two or three of the binoculars, I could find it, but the rest of them I couldn't, and I didn't think it was fair to share for just a couple. So again, if you know which of these, or if you have a reliable source for finding out that type of detailed information, drop a note in the comments section below. I would be uh, particularly grateful. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between a roof prism and a poro prism. I'm gonna pop up a couple graphics on the screen here, and right away, what you're gonna notice is that a roof prism is in line within the binocular and a poro prism is kind of this offset reflective prism. Now, technically, you can achieve a higher quality optical experience with a poro prism. However, there is a durability penalty to take. Now, the only company that uses a poro prism is Athlon, and they're the cheapest binocular here. So I don't know any of this for a fact, take it with a grain of salt, but I was asking myself like, what would be a reasonable explanation for why the lowest priced binocular would technically use the prism that would produce the highest quality image? And I think it's because it's gonna help you offset some of your other decisions that sacrificed image quality. If your glass quality wasn't quite as high, if your glass coatings weren't quite as high, 
if you had to use um, other components that were more expensive somewhere else in the binocular, you could kind of, you know, get a couple bonus points in optical clarity by using a poro prism. Now, that being said, you could potentially be sacrificing um, durability by doing so. So again, some of this information, I'm not even sure how it's going to affect your um, purchase decision, but I think it's important to note because it's interesting at the very least. So all the rest of them have roof prisms of one shape or another, and the Athlon has a poro prism. Okay, now for something that, you know, really matters, field of view. All right, let's start at the smallest field of view and work our way up. So the Noctavids clock in at 336, Athlons 338, Leica Trinavids 339, Trax 341, the Zeiss Conquests 345, and finally the Swaro NL Pures at 399. So what I think this graph does a particularly good job of illustrating is that for five of these binoculars, there is really a marginal difference to the point where I don't even think it's a data point willing to pay attention to when considering the purchase. However, with the Swaros, you are looking at almost a 15% increase in field of view, which has a profound effect on a couple of things. One, the amount of area you can view at one time, because remember, we're only looking at like, you know, one could say the diameter of this like circular field of vision. So there's actually like a, a squared impact on the entire area under view. So if the horizontal distance is 15% greater, the actual amount of viewable area that's greater than these other binoculars is even more impactful than that. Now, one of the unexpected consequences of this is handshake. So most people run tens because as soon as you get over a 10 power binocular, everybody's hands shake a little bit. And when you hold them up to your forehead, unless you're really skilled, most people kind of tap out at a 10 and they can't successfully handhold 12s. Now, field of view impacts handshake because the smaller the field of view, so if the handshake is the same, holding two different binoculars, and this is why people can get away with it with 10s but can't get away with it with 12s because typically as magnification goes up, field of view come down. For example, a pair of eight power binoculars are gonna have a greater field of view than a pair of 10 power binoculars. So if the handshake is equal in two situations, but we increase the field of view in the second situation, the apparent handshake, or the amount of shake perceived by our eyes is gonna be reduced in the binoculars with the increased field of view because the shake is kind of spread out over a greater area. If you want another example of this being illustrated, think of your spotting scope fully zoomed in. The slightest touch and the, like the thing just wobbles like crazy when you're looking through it. But when you zoom all the way out to three power, or sorry, not three power, I run a Harpia, so the magnification is like one to three X. But when let's say you, you zoom all the way out to 25 X, you hit the spotting scope the same way, the wobbles are very tolerable. You zoom all the way into 70, tap the spotting scope again, and the wobbles are completely disruptive. So in my experience, you can almost move one binocular up in your handshake. So I actually own the NL Pure 12s. And one of the huge selling points for me is that I used to own the Zeiss Victory SFs. And I, I bought the NL Pures at the same time so I could run them side by side on a couple hunts. And it would be basically identical handshake in the Victories as there was in the NL Pures. But I got an extra 2x zoom with the NL Pures. So for a guy like me who does a lot of Western hunting, does a lot of sheep hunting, does a lot of like big country glassing, and always face the problem, do I run 10X and a spotter? If I'm gonna run 10X, should I bring a pair of 15s? If I have a partner, should one guy bring the spotter, the other guy bring two binos? Or one guy bring a spotter and binos and the other guy bring the 15s? And then I found once I could bring 12s, 12s got me close enough to a 15, but they were still good enough to handhold like a 10 
They're kind of like the unicorn of the binocular world for me. The other thing about the NL Pures is the headrest attachment. I strongly recommend it because having that third point of contact, you know, two points with the eye cups and the third point with the headrest attachment, it is wild how much more stability that adds. And if you can then also be wearing a ball cap and kind of pinch your ball cap between your front two fingers and kind of pull the binoculars into your head while pulling the ball cap away from your head, I feel completely locked in in that situation. So yes, it's nice to have more viewable area under, under view at any given point in time. However, I actually think the more profound impact of the increased field of view is reduced handshake. So even if you only want to stick with tens, you're going to feel like you've got the handshake of eights in your hand, but you've got the zoom power of tens. Um, and I really think that's something very important to note with Swaro because technologically speaking, nobody's caught up with the NL Pures yet. I think in the next couple of years, you'll see Leica and Zeiss come out with an upgraded model that will have some of the same feature set. The one note of caution I want to make is that, because I get a lot of people messaging me about their optics, you know, purchasing decisions, and I do get about 1% of people who buy, maybe 1% to 2% of people who buy NL Pures. So it's the, um, the flattening aspects of Swaro Vision that enable them to kind of compress the field of view and get more area under, you know, view at any given time. And for some people, this produces like discomfort. The eyes don't like the way it looks. Swirl vision kind of like trips them out, might give them headaches or make them feel nauseous after a while. It's not something that I would typically worry about, but if, you, if, you're, if you've if you put, and the ELs kind of did the same thing, not to the same degree as the NLs, but if you've ever used Swirl binoculars and it just makes you feel uncomfortable, that's why, and unfortunately, if you fall into that small group, I wouldn't recommend buying the NL Pures. All right, let's move on to glass quality. Now, assessing glass quality can be a tricky thing. A lot of these glasses are proprietary, and I'm making some assumptions when I kind of rank order these, but let's walk through them in order. So, tied for first place, and we're gonna talk about glass coatings second. I need to make that very clear. There is the physical glass used in each of these, but then there are also proprietary coatings, and I'm gonna get into that in a minute. So tied for first place is Swarovski, Leica Noctavid, and Tract. Now, I know you're gonna say, how on earth is a you know, $700 pair of binoculars tying with a $3,300 pair of binoculars for quality of glass? Well, Tract has licensed Zeiss, Zeiss and Schott, S-C-H-O-T-T, -T, are like sister companies. And Schott is the one who makes the glass for Zeiss. It's used in all their medical imaging devices, all their optics, everything. Now, the Schott has a couple different lines of glass, but their alpha glass is Schott HT, which stands for high transmission. Tract has licensed Schott HT glass for use in their optics. So you are seeing the exact same glass in these binoculars that you would see in the Zeiss Victories, that you would see in a Zeiss Harpia. Now they don't have the same coatings, but they do have the same glass. Coming in at second place is, tied for second place, are the Conquests and the Trinivid. So one thing to note is that the Conquests use the one step down shot glass, which is shot HD. So this is a fluoride containing high definition glass, but it is not of the same caliber as the high transmission glass, which is one step up from that. Now tied for second place are the Zeiss Conquests and the Leica Trinivid. So the Zeiss uses the shot fluoride containing HD glass. So that's one step down from the HT. I can't find a specific reference to guarantee that the Trinivids use the same glass, but I'm gonna make an assumption that I did find a reference on a birding website that did let me know that the, it, the Trinivids do not use the HT glass, they use a slightly inferior glass, but it didn't name the glass. And I'm gonna make the assumption that if the Noctavids are using the shot HT, then the Trinivids are most likely using the shot HD. 
And then coming in in last place is the Athlons. Now, yet again, here's where the marketing jargon, you know, rears its ugly head. Here's what Athlon says about their glass. It's UHD. Okay, what does that mean? Nothing. So back when high definition TVs came out, you know, that was 1920 by 1080. That was a technical description referring to the amount of pixels in the screen. The optics world has kind of like latched on to this HD and UHD as kind of like they're, they're piggybacking on what our brains link to it in terms of digital devices. There is no technical description or like, you know, actual definition for UHD. It stands for ultra high definition, but ultra high definition and compared to what? Um, extra low dispersion so that does talk about a specific type of glass but it offers no technical details it offers a lot of times you can infer the quality of the glass by the amount of fluoride present for example some people would say that kawa actually has the highest quality glass on the market and they use a pure fluorite crystal but even the swaros only use a fluorite containing HD. So the fact that they don't even mention fluoride or fluorite in their description whatsoever is kind of a red flag to me because all the other alpha glasses will talk about the fluoride content within that glass. And when they don't, it's kind of like, eh. And the funny thing is the UHD, the extra low dispersion, this is the exact same verbiage that Vortex uses. Vortex is also made in China. I don't think it's a big stretch to say that it is very possible. It's the same, you know, bunk glass that Vortex uses. Now, it's not to say the binoculars are bunk, but what it is to say is if you're not willing to tell me what your binoculars are actually made of without the use of useless marketing jargon, um, my trust is gone. It's evaporated because, it, you know, all these other binoculars, obviously with the exception of the, the Trinavid, um, talk specifics about the glass. So Athlons come in last place kind of by default because they weren't willing to disclose what actual glass is used in their binoculars. Okay, let's move on to glass coatings. Now I did not score this, and if you're curious about it, I did a bit of a deep dive in the spotting scope review and you can go look at that if you want to listen to me talk about glass coatings for 10 minutes. Here's the abbreviated version. Glass coatings are highly proprietary. So there is no objective way to quantify the relative differences and benefits and drawbacks of the different coatings used. It's really all just a bunch of marketing jargon. So. I could do a score here based on anecdotal evidence, but I think that would be a little bit inauthentic to the nature of the review. We're supposed to be using data and quantifying things. I can tell you this, one of the things that, one of the primary things that separates alpha glass from beta glass is the coatings. For example, let's look at the Leica Noctavids compared to the Tract Torix. They both use shot HT glass. So what are some of the differences then? Well, it could be the number of elements. Um, it could be the prism style, even though these both have roof prisms, they could be different types of roof prisms. But other than that, if they're made of the same glass, what accounts for the drastic difference in optical performance? Because no one is ever gonna tell you that the tracks compete realistically with the Noctavids. It's a $3,000 bino versus a $700 bino. It's like bringing a knife to a gunfight. The primary thing accounting for that difference in optical performance is the coatings. So this is one of those things where you're just gonna have to use a little bit of common sense. The three big guys tend to have superior coatings. Do I have a way to quantify that for you? No, I do not. I'd love to get somebody on the podcast to kind of do a bit of a deep dive into that, but until further notice, that's about all I can offer in terms of detail surrounding glass coatings. Okay, up next is eye relief. Now, eye relief refers to the distance your eyes can be from the ocular lens while still reconciling an image. So, um, and, and typically, 
the longer the eye relief, the more comfortable the binoculars are because it creates a bigger eye box. I want you to think about an eye box as a 3D cube extruding from the back of the eye cups. And this would be the area within which your eyes could be where you would still create like a full visual picture. And if you pull back too far, you kind of see that narrowing effect. Think about it with a rifle scope. You know that sweet spot? As soon as you pop your eye in there, you get a perfect sight picture. Resolve, that's the word I was looking for. It helps your eyes resolve the sight picture. Well, you know that if you move your head an inch back or an inch forward, you lose the resolution of that sight picture. That's because you've moved your eyes out of the eye box. Now, optics with greater eye boxes or larger eye boxes tend to be more comfortable because they're a little more forgiving about where your eyes can be. Everybody's had one of those rifle scopes that if your head's not in the exact perfect location, you can't resolve a perfect sight picture. So um, starting at the top and working our way down, uh, we have the Athlons coming in at 19.3, the Noctavids coming in at 19, Swaro at 18, Tract and Zeiss kind of tie at 17. I couldn't find a reputable source for Zeiss's eye relief. I found one source saying 17 and another source saying 18. So I just kind of averaged it. And then fifth place of the Trinovids at 15. That was all in millimeters. So kind of interesting that the Tract has such large eye relief. They are a comfortable optic to look through. So I'm sure it's one of the contributing factors. Um, Close focus distance, listen, this is an interesting data point, but are you gonna be looking at stuff six, seven feet away? No, but does it indicate an increased versatility with the optic? I think so. So starting at the bottom and working our way up, tracked is 8.2 feet. Uh, Athlon, Swaro, and Zeiss tie at 6.6 .6 feet. Noctavid at 6.2 feet and the Trinivid at 5.3 feet. Now let's talk about light transmission. And I think this is a bit of a controversial topic because A, there is not a standardized way to measure and share this information. And without getting into the nitty gritty, there are ways to skew the representation of this data. Like light transmission shows up as a graph and you could share the peak of that graph, but the peak of the graph is not always where the majority of the visible light spectrum is. So even though if it's got 95% light transmission at the peak, if that's not part of the visible light spectrum, it doesn't matter to me. And maybe by the time you get down to the visible light spectrum, you're at 85%. Optics manufacturers can also play kind of games and compromise optical clarity and crispness in order to increase brightness. And when we get into the optical performance, you're gonna see an exact case of that, where there's a slightly brighter image, but it appears a little dusty. However, that being said, Leica, Swaro, and Zeiss all share light transmission data. So in first place, the Noctavid and the Swaro come in at 91%. To give you an idea, Anything over 80% in the industry is considered good. Anything over 90% in the industry is considered excellent. So Swaro and Leica, Noctavid tie for first place at 91% and the Trinovid and the Zeiss tie uh, for second place with a light transmission of 90%. Also indicating that both pairs probably use similar quality glass. Now I contacted both Athlon and Tract. Um, to their credit, they both got back to me very quickly. John from Tract gave a very detailed explanation why they don't share it. Athlon, not so much. Um, but they did indicate they don't share that data publicly. Um, there's two ways to look at this. I think they're well-intentioned people. They probably feel like because people play games with those numbers, if they don't play some similar games and they share data that isn't relatable, to the other numbers, like maybe it's an 85 or an 84. I mean, who knows? I don't know what the numbers are. And maybe it's, it's gonna inappropriately make their optic look inferior when it's not. Um, my gut says the light transmission 
Like, why is it only the two budget guys, right? Um, uh, the three big guys, Zeiss, Leica, and Swaro are all comfortable sharing the data. The two budget optics that are using lower quality pieces in construction and manufacturing in order to achieve the price points that they have aren't willing to share the data. So I'm not gonna draw any conclusions, but I think you should just keep that in mind. So they tied for third place because if they're not willing to share any data at all, then I just have to knock them down to third place. It's only one point, it's not the end of the world, but um, it's interesting to note. Interpupillary distance. So this is the distance between the two eye cups and you will see it, 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 it's actually a range. So this would be the shortest interpupillary distance, the distance between the two pupils, and this would be the greatest interpupillary distance. Now, there's a couple reasons why this is good to know. Um, if you have a particularly small face or a particularly wide face, you're gonna wanna look at the lower and upper end of those ranges because they are not all created equal and it's gonna impact how well the binoculars fit you individually. So coming in at first place is Zeiss with a range of 54 to 74 millimeters. Tied for second place is the Noctavid, the Trinavid, and Swaro that all have a range of 18 millimeters. The Noctavid and the Swaro going from 56 to 74 millimeters and the Trinavid kind of moving up two millimeters. So here's an example of it's got the widest pupillary distance going from 58 to 76. So the same 18 millimeter difference, but it ends up opening a little bit wider. So like the Zeiss opens to 74 and the Trinavids open to 76. So if you had a really wide face, maybe you would want to consider the Trinavids because you're going to get an extra two millimeters interpupillary distance. And then finally in third place, the Athlons with 17 millimeters, 56 to 73. So kind of a little bit more narrow. And then finally, the most narrow are the tracks. They come in with only 14 millimeters of range from 58 to 72. So if you have a really wide face, I've got a pretty fat melon and these fit me. So it's not like I'd worry about it, but it's just something to consider. So let's look at the optics totals as a whole. So if we start at the bottom and work our way up, Athlon with, Athlon with 14 points, the Trinavid with 13 points, Tract with 13, Noctavid with 12, Conquest with 12, and the NL Pures with nine. So really not that much discrepancy between the Zeiss and the Athlon, to be honest, like only two points between second place and sixth place. And this is where Swaro is really starting to step ahead. Um, having three points, it's like, you know, close to a 30% improvement or a 30% better score than the second place, I would say is fairly statistically significant. All right, let's move on to the two last classes and we're gonna talk about these in conjunction. So this was performance and operation. So this was field testing. So I took all these binoculars out to the field several times. I did wildlife testing, I did landscape testing, I did bright light, I did low light, I had them on tripod, I did them handheld, and I also have an eye chart. For me, the eye chart is the gold standard. After looking at everything else and taking my notes, I always find myself with the eye chart at the end of the night because it's the only thing where I can literally see as I move down line by line the differences in resolution and how crisp and clear an image it is. And last night when I was finalizing all the testing, I went out to a local park here, I set them all up, I stuck the um, eye chart a few hundred yards away, and I literally sat there with all six binos on tripods through the entirety of sunset. And like, just kept flicking back and forth through them all. And the one thing that I can tell you is that when there was sufficient light, it is painstaking to really try and describe the differences between these. I'm not saying you can't see the difference between the Tract and the Swaros, you can. But to try and describe it, and then when you start to get closer, like try and put the Trinivids next to the Conquest and then you tell me which one's better. It's tough, man. And even tougher, you know, the Conquest versus the Tract or the Athlons versus the Tract or the Swaro NL Pures versus the Noctavid. Like these are, it's really difficult. So I did my best to quantify it. I ranked things 
along nine different categories in total and then took some qualitative notes in addition to that. The one note I wanna to make to kind of call myself out is that I've ran the 12 Power NL Pures for two years. It's really hard after running one pair of binos for two years to not just feel at home with those binos. When things feel good, things look good. And it was, I really had to just keep reminding myself just because these feel comfortable, don't score them higher. So I'm saying that in the interest of transparency, I think I did a fairly good job at, you know, negating any bias I had, but I thought it was only fair to call that out. Um, but the one point I wanna drive home that I feel like I only made halfway is that it was really sitting through that sunset period a couple nights where the differences really get magnified. As soon as you're in that last half an hour of daylight, um, you really start to notice the differences between the different optics and how they're different. One quick note I wanna make about all the testing that I did with the binoculars. I wanted a way to reduce the amount of variables between the viewing experience. So I reached out to Rydell at Asiac Equipment who makes these bino clamps. And I said, listen, man, I don't really have a budget to buy six bino clamps. Would you be interested in kind of soft sponsoring the video? Send me enough eye clamps. Maybe we'll give a couple of them away. I'll ship the rest back to you. He was super into it. Rydell is an awesome guy. I do have some other gear of his that's kind of under wraps right now that I will be reviewing in the next few weeks. And I'm very excited to kind of share that information. But I wanna give a shout out to Rydell. I wanna give a shout out to Asiac Equipment. And I wanna let you know that I'm gonna be giving away two of these bino clamps. So if you put in the, in the comments section below which pair of binoculars you own, I will randomly select two winners and I will ship you an Asiac bino clamp. So cheers to Rydell for that. So in the performance category, I looked at image crispness, low light performance, edge to edge clarity and chromatic aberration. Now coming in at first place was the Swaro, second place was the Noctavid, third place was the Conquest, fourth place was the Tract, fifth place was the Trinivid, and sixth place was the Athlon. And I wanna take a moment and kinda of call that out. It was only a difference of four points, but I did feel that once the sun started to go down, the tracks really pulled ahead of the Trinivids, specifically when I was looking at the eye chart. I lost an entire line of resolution with the Trinivids compared to the uh, tracks. Now, that was kind of the starkest difference between any two of the pairs. Like I could pull them up, read this many lines, pull them up, read one less line. Like it was that dramatic. And when you start looking at the crispness and the clarity and the chromatic aberration, the bottom line is the tracks in optical performance, I really feel just pulled out ahead of the Trinivids. I think everything else landed where one with a you know decent amount of optics experience would expect it to land. But that was particularly interesting to me. Now, in the operational class, we have ergonomics, focus, eye box, diopter adjustment, and eye cups. So this is basically like the look and feel and how you engage and utilize the binoculars. So coming in at first place is Swaro. Coming in at second place is the Noctavid. Third place is Zeiss. There's a tie for fourth, fourth place between the Trax and the Trinivid. And then in last place is the Athlon. Uh, the one note I want to make is eye cups. These all have decent eye cups, except for two pairs of binoculars. The Athlons only have one setting. They're either in or they're out. You could put them halfway, but you don't, there's no places to lock them. That bugs me because it's basically saying that there's only, there's either in people or out people. And if you're anywhere in between, you're screwed. 
that is a very low degree of adjustability. If we look at something like the NL Pures, eight different stages. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you have eight different degrees of height that you can adjust these to. Most of these don't have eight, but let's assume they all have four or five. That's a big knock for me against the Athlon, and they got marked down for that. The second one is the Conquests. Now these are the second generation that have the improved eye cups. I'm not gonna put these eye cups down because if I do, I may never get them back up. It's very hard to explain, but you basically have to fiddle with these because if you just twist them, they just unscrew. And the only way you can get them to come up is this like weird combination of like upward and outward force and like, you know, praying to a variety of gods and giving rights to your firstborn children. Like it took me like 40 minutes to get these fully extended. And I need to use, I need maximum eye relief. So I use eye cups fully extended. Now, the last version, the eye cups, cups kept popping off all the time. They have fixed that with these ones. And once you do get them extended, they stay extended. Like they're very solid, they go nowhere, still lots of room in your bino harness. I wasn't comfortable recommending the, con the previous version of Conquests. Even though there's still eye cup issues, I am comfortable recommending this version of Conquests simply because um, once they're out, they stay out. So if you know where you want them, it's gonna be a bit finicky, might take you a few minutes, you might feel like putting a hole in the wall, but once you get them out, they'll stay out. So these were literally just the hand notes that I was bombing on my spreadsheet while doing this to try and help keep my thoughts organized. But I think by sharing them, I, it will just help add some more color and context to the ratings and rankings that I gave. So under Athlon, I wrote slightly brighter, but a little dustier looking than the tract. And I think that might have something to do with the Poro Prism. I don't know. At first I thought I was getting a better optical image because it was brighter. But then when I really started to pay attention, you know when you're looking through your spotting scope and the sun starts peeking in through the corner and your field of view gets brighter, but it also gets washed out. It wasn't that intense, but it was like the same principle. And the best way I could put it is the image just looked, it looked brighter, but it looked dustier. Uh, shallowest depth of field. So I wanna take a minute on this because I think this is actually something that's accounting for the more enjoyable optical experience with the higher end binoculars. So if we think about the depth of field, I want you to think about focusing on something in your field of view. Now, how far in front and how far behind can you go of that and still have things in focus just by moving your eyes. Is it 10 yards? Is it 20 yards? Is it five yards? The shorter, the slimmer that area in focus is, we call that a shallow depth of field. In photography, this is a positive characteristic because this is where you get the blurred out background with the nice bokeh and the, you know, the portrait photography that looks really beautiful. Um, However, we don't want it to be too shallow because otherwise you'll have to constantly be adjusting focus. Like when you glass a mountain, you're trying to grid it out and within one sight picture, you might have things that are hundreds of yards apart. Obviously you're gonna have to do some focus wheel adjustment, but the larger the depth of field under focus at one given time, the easier the glassing experience. And the Athlon was notably shallow. Like I had this one tree that I was counting twigs on as part of like one of the tests. And then I had another tree that had kind of shallows at the base. And I was seeing how clearly I could see into the shadows with all the binoculars. All of the other binoculars had leaves in the shadows in focus. Athlon wasn't even close. I had to focus on the two sections differently in order to look at them differently. So that was a little bit annoying. Now, the Noctavids, I said they're easier to look through than the Trinivid or the Zeiss. Like they're just a little more pleasant and they seem to have more pop and 3D. 
Now, obviously that's gonna have something to do with the coatings and the higher quality glass because it's shot HT and I'm pretty sure both the Trinavid and the Conquest are shot HD one step down, but it was notable. Like telling the difference between the Conquest and the Trinavid is like picking flies out of horse shit. It's a struggle. But then once you go over the Noctivids, you're like, okay, no, these are better. Like I can see more leaves, they're popping out to me. I can see like the depth in everything, whereas these like present a slightly flattened image. The Trinavid I noticed are too small for my hands. They were hard to focus in low light. I kind of lost the Christmas crispness in low light and they fell off the hardest in low light. Within a 10 minute window, a 10 out of 10 optical performance that I would have given the Trinavid turned into a six out of 10. Whereas the rest of the binoculars, even the Athlons, didn't seem to be degrading at such a high speed. So for Swaros, I said crisper and brighter than the Noctavid. Focus wheel being forward is huge. I want you to look at all these. The distance between the eye cup and the focus wheel on all of them is kind of the same. But the, one of the main differences between the EL and the NL is that they move the diopter behind and the focus wheel in front. So when you hold these, this is where your finger lands. Whereas something like the Athlon, this is where my finger lands and I keep having to like reset it to use the focus wheel. Whereas like you just grab these and it's like your finger falls on the focus wheel every single time. Like it's just a thing of beauty. And it's like, that's what you get with, you know, <laughs> for $2,300 more than the Conquest, you get a slightly better placed focus wheel along with some other bells and whistles. But that's the type of design intentionality you get with these ultra premium products. The other thing about the Swaro is like, you can go back and forth between all of these other five, including the Noctavid, and you'll be like, oh, that's a little bit different. And oh, there's a little bit, I can see a leaf there. And like, it's all very small. You pick up those NL Pures and it's just like, bam. Like the richness and the detail and the color profile, like you, you just almost get this little smile on your face. You're like this is so pleasant to look through. Um, the tracks, uh, a little bit more detail in the shadows than the Athlon. Def definitely more depth and crispness than the Athlon. I found the focus wheel a little too stiff for my tastes and it has a decent rubberized coating, but I kind of felt like, I don't know if squishy is the right word or this texturizing, like these rubberized coatings have a premium feel to them. I don't know how else to describe it. The tracks have not achieved that. I think in the next generation, they might want to look at their rubberized coating because I think there's room for improvement there. And then finally on the Conquest, I said a little brighter than the Trinavids and the rubberized coating is very good. And again, a lot of this is just personal preference, but I review a lot of gear and I put a lot of optics in my hands and some things you touch and feel and you engage with and you're like, it just feels like quality. Like it gives you a sense of peace of mind. Like you know you're holding something in your hands that's not gonna let you down. And that's how you feel when you grab that. For example, you go over to the Athlons, the, the, the kind of funky eye cups, this kind of big clunky um, focus knob, like, Listen, for 500 bucks, they're a great choice and they kick the shit out of a lot of other stuff on the market. But when you place them against these other brands, they simply don't have the same user experience that the more premium products do. So there we go. That is the kind of notes that I took while doing the testing. Okay, everything is said and done. Let's look at the actual scoring and where they ranked across all five categories. So not much of a surprise here. The Swarovski NL Pure come in with a score of 44, giving them first place. Like a Noctavid, score of 52 for second place. Third place, Zeiss Conquest with a score of 64. And then just behind, tied for fourth place, are the Tracked 
and the Leica Trinavid with a score of 66. And then in fifth place is the Athlon Cronus G2. Now, I say this in all my videos and I will keep saying it with all my, in all my videos. I think it's important to use a ranking system. I think it's important to get as much quantifiable data as possible. But I also think it's important to take that data in context and take it all with a grain of salt. Here's one of the most important things I learned because I've never looked through this many pairs of binoculars before. Even more than a spotting scope, because you're putting two eyes in at the same time, how well a pair of binoculars are gonna work for you is highly dependent upon you as an individual. So even, I can't even, like let's take the Swarovski and El Pures. I can tell you they're the best, but for the one to 2% of the people who have some kind of like ocular issue with Swaro vision, they're clearly not the best. I will be honest, the Leicas don't really agree with my face. I had a hard time finding the eye box with both of these binoculars. I, I don't know why. Every time I put them up to my face, I kind of had to fiddle with them. I personally wouldn't run Leicas because of this. I think they're a fantastic choice. I'm gonna get into which one I would recommend for you guys, but for my own personal like eye placement and comfort, I I'd run a Zeiss or a Swaro because it, they fit my face better. So what I'm trying to say here is I will run through my recommendations and kind of let you know what I would do given different budgets and why I would do it. But that being said, if you have the opportunity, and if you're in town, reach out to me. If you're, you know, this is the great thing about belonging to Mindful Reviews. Reach out to some buddies. See if you can swap binos with them for a couple weeks. Like, try and put yourself in situations. Go volunteer for the Wild Sheep Society or Wild Sheep Foundation and go do a sheep count and pop around and see some different dudes and stick your face in different glass because no matter how good the data is and no matter how convincing the marketing jargon is, at the end of the day, if the binoculars don't agree with you and your own individual preferences, none of that other shit matters. So, and I recognize, especially living in Canada, we are forced to make online purchases where we don't get to play with this stuff. Or you're walking into Cabela's and using it under brightly lit lights and, and the more I think about it now, I think we can do a good job of quantifying optical clarity. It's the fit and finish and the personal um, engagement. And I, so I do think you can get a lot out of going to a big box store and seeing like, how's the eye box? If I just lift these to my face, like one of the tricks somebody taught me when you when you have a new rifle with a scope is like, how comfortable is lowering your head into the scope and resolving your sight picture. If you can just pop it in and it's there, that's a good natural fit. If you're fighting with it for 30 seconds, it's not. Binos are the same way. Some of these I can just lift to my face and I'm looking through crisp, clear image, full sight picture, beautiful. Other ones that are actually of higher quality, I lift to my face, it's a little blurry for a second, I kinda need to focus my eyes, I might need to wiggle around a couple things and then, oh, now we're good. But that period of adjustment, when you're doing that 10, 50, 100 times a day, that's where you're gonna get eye strain from. You're gonna be less likely to look through your binos. So I'll get into my recommendations, but take them all with a grain of salt because I still think ultimately putting your hands on these and putting them up to your face is really necessary before you make a purchase decision of this magnitude. Okay, let's talk about the premium user because that is the easiest recommendation to make. Swaro and El Pure. If you are the type of person who loves having the best of whatever it is you're buying, that's me. Luckily, I'm at a point in my life where I can afford to buy the best. Um, I can tell you unequivocally, these are the best binoculars on the face of the planet. There's no denying that. There's nothing technologically that can compete with these that are on the market right now. Some people are gonna say they prefer the Noctavids. Some people are gonna say they prefer the, the Zeiss Victories. Color profile this, chromatic aberration that, that's fine. If they suit your eyes better, that's fine. But if we're talking objective, quantifiable data, these are the best. You may prefer something else, but don't kid yourself, these are the best. So this is what we're gonna raffle off. A brand new pair 
of Swarovski NL Pure 10 by 42s. So if you go to mindful-reviews.com, buy a membership, purchase a raffle ticket, you can win a pair of these binoculars. So unlimited budget, love amazing gear, been hunting for a while, you want the best of the best, you buy the Swarovskis. Now, let's look at the low budget guy. So if we started the premium, let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum. And you tell me, you know, I got a young family, I got a limited budget, what should I buy? The Tract Toric. Coming in at $694, it is only $194 more than the Athlon Cronus, and it is a significant improvement in optical performance and ergonomics. And $300 less than the Trinavid or the Conquest. Now you are taking a compromise, a slight compromise in optical performance, but if budget is your absolute priority, I recommend the Tract Toric. Now, there are other budget optics on the market. People are gonna say, why didn't I include Leupold? I tried contacting Leupold multiple times to see if, um, if they would send me a pair of binoculars to review and I would happily ship them back when I was done. I make it very clear to these companies I'm not looking for free gear. Now, they saw my message on social media because you can get the little you know scene kind of thing and they never bothered replying to me. I reached out to a couple friends. Nobody really had the right pair of loopholes that would have sat well in this lineup. So I'm not saying there aren't other budget-friendly bino options on the market, but here's what I am saying. There are definitely better budget-friendly binoculars than others. If you were to compare these against whatever, um, Binos would run you about $700 from Vortex. I feel very comfortable telling you that the tracked ones would blow them out of the water. So if budget is your primary concern, but you still, because here's the other thing, people are gonna say, yeah, budget's my concern, I got 300 bucks. I'm not interested in giving $300 recommendations for binoculars, because once you get down that low, shit starts to fall off fast. And it's like, this is an expensive sport, especially if you're gonna go in the back country. By the time you look at all your gear, your tent, your food, your boots, your backpack, we're talking multiple thousands of dollars, probably tens of thousands of dollars by the time you do this for 10 or 20 years. I would, my strong recommendation is that you would not just want to spend any less than $700 on a pair of binoculars and these really stand out as a high value proposition for 700 bucks. They're, you would think that the difference in price between the Athlons and the Tracks were more significant by how much more I liked the Tracks than the Athlons. Now let's go to the last guy. I'm in the middle of the road, I got a little bit of money, but I don't want the best, I don't want the worst, I want like a solid workhorse. I gotta go with the Zeiss Conquest HD. Their optical performance was definitely, in my opinion, and if you prefer the Trinovids over these and you've looked through them both, I'm not gonna argue with you. They're so close that, you know, there's some personal preference involved here for sure, but based on my ranking system, I found the optical performance of the Zeiss slightly better than the optical performance of the Trinavid. And for the extra 300 bucks, I do think you're getting a slightly better binocular than the Tract. $300 better? Hard to say. It really comes down to nitpicking details. Um, like I mentioned before, in the qualitative notes section under the performance and operation scoring system. You know, the rubberized coating on the Tract, it doesn't have a premium feel like the Zeiss does. You know, the eye cups are a little bit loose for, for, for my tastes. They don't have the high quality feel. Now, they, we probably shouldn't have a conversation about the Zeiss eye cups if I'm gonna recommend these, 
but once you have them out, they are so solid. And the rubberized coating, these kind of have this like, it, it's almost, it's rubberized as well, but it's just not as premium a feel. And then the really stiff focus wheel with the tracks compared to the kind of buttery smooth Zeiss focus wheel, it's all minor differences. So I will leave it up to you guys to decide, but budget option, tracked, Toric, mid-range option, Zeiss Conquest HD, premium option, Swaro NL Pure. And that's about all I got for you guys. I hope that didn't drag on too long. I hope it was informative. And I want you to take more away from these reviews than just the data pertaining to these particular binoculars. What I'm trying to share with you is like a way of thinking about assessing products and a way of looking at potential purchases that can hopefully save you money and put you in products that are better suited to your needs so you don't have to buy two or three versions of a thing before you find the version that suits you perfectly. So again, if you wanna participate in the raffle or you just wanna support the reviews that I'm doing, head on over to mindful-reviews.com, join up, participate in the raffle. If you got a lifetime membership, you're gonna be signed up for monthly giveaways. I just gave, um, we're giving away a processing knife this month from Bruce Culberson. I gave away a meter meat thermometer last month. I gave away a Go GoPro. Uh, Hero Black 11 the month before that like there's some kick-ass prizes being given away If you have any feedback drop it in the comments section below. I would greatly appreciate the engagement um, And if I can learn some more from you guys, I'm always open to that and until next time Thanks for tuning in